Teresa Tomlinson. Teresa, yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in. My name is Teresa Tomlinson. I'm a proud Georgian, a proud uh, candidate for the Democratic nomination for United States Senate to replace David Perdue. And we're here to wish you a very happy 50th uh, celebration of Earth Day. So thank you for taking some time out of your evening to join us here. We have an amazing audience. I uh, frankly am floored by the number of people who wanted to join us in this discussion. You can see this amazing panelist. I'm gonna let uh, Man Mandy Mahoney um, uh, introduce everyone in just a moment, but let me say a few quick words of welcome. Uh, you know, we are in a moment in this country's history where sometimes it seems like we're going backward. And uh, sometimes it seems uh, perhaps there's not a lot of hope on the horizon, but what we're going to be doing here tonight is recognizing our challenges uh, recognizing the solutions that are available to us and we're going to leave everyone here uh, with a hopeful sense of how we can take control of our own destiny um, to be a better better people uh, to be a better participants in this planet that we all share because if this COVID-19 epidemic hasn't or pandemic hasn't taught us anything it's that we're all connected uh, we share the same earth uh, we share the same community we share the same environment, we share the same economy. And so when any part of it's not functioning properly, it affects us all. Uh, so uh, please stay tuned for what will be an enlightening and uplifting conversation today. We look forward to your questions. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to put your questions in. We have a whole team that will be vetting through those. So uh, I wanna just mention a few quick things here. Uh, the first scholarly paper, on the connection between uh, the production of carbon and the effect on global temperatures was written in 1896. 1896 out of the University of Stockholm. So folks, we have eaten up a whole lot of runway to address this problem. Uh, when people tell us it's not the time, uh, please know that it's been a very long time. And so the time is now. Uh, when people tell us that it's too costly to address some of these things, know that we're already paying for it. So shouldn't we be using our money to stop the negative impact on our lives and on our communities? Uh, shouldn't we be spending the money in a way uh, that could create investment as well as nurture uh, our environment? Uh, those are some of the challenges I set forth to you to consider uh, tonight. And again, welcome. Thank you so very much for being with us. And I wanna turn it over uh, to Mandy Mahoney to introduce herself very quickly and the rest of this awesome panel. Wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. And I'm just so appreciative of your vision and leadership on these critical issues. As you just shared, we know that you're passionate about it. And from your time as mayor of Columbus, you've done a tremendous amount to support the environmental issues in our state. So we're excited to be in dialogue with you tonight to talk about these things. Um, and I am Mandy Mahoney. I'm a Macon native who lives in Atlanta, and I serve as the president of the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance. And I'm joined tonight by three just incredible leaders in our state on these issues. Briante McCorkle is the executive director of Georgia Conservation Voters. Chandra Farley is the Just Energy Director for the Partnership for Southern Equity. And Caroline McGee is both associate priest at St. Bede's Episcopal Church as well as being an attorney at King and & Spaulding. And this evening, we are gonna talk about some of the real current and near-term threats of climate that we are facing here in Georgia, but also nationally, as well as the hyper-local immediate effects we're feeling right now of the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated and exacerbated the, the problems that are felt in environmental justice communities. Uh, and so we're thrilled that Chandra and Briante are going to be able to speak to us more about what they're seeing on the ground throughout our state, as well as solutions that they are finding from within communities to serve their own needs. And Caroline has a long history of working and helping people address trauma um, and as a priest and is going to talk to us about how that we recognize that what we're dealing with right now in the pandemic is trauma and that as we face climate change more and more we have ways that we can integrate that sorrow grief into our lives so that it doesn't sink us but rather so we can live in a powerful place to drive change 
So I'm going to start out just by giving a couple remarks, Teresa, on you know what brought me to these issues and what we what we see. Um, I, as I shared, I I am a Macon native, and growing up in Macon, the the um, the field trip was to go over to the Kaolin mines in Sandersville and look for shark's teeth. And as a little kid, that seemed so weird because I knew to drive down to Savannah, we'd have to drive for a long time. Why were there shark teeth? And as I got older, I realized at a different point in geolo geologic time, the ocean used to come up to the fall line. It used to come up to Macon. And so that has made it really hit home for me that there are things we've got to think of now. And as I look at the what we've seen with are seeing now with the pandemic, um, as a professional who's worked in, a, in climate change my whole career, and I, the list of things that will affect us from climate include things like increased disease. We've seen that with more mosquito-borne illnesses. It hit me home. It hit him very personal to me. We lost my father four years ago to mad cow disease, and he is, was an avid hunter in in middle Georgia and one thing I've made peace with is that he contracted that disease because our environment is weaker. There are more, more of these threats that we're seeing are able to spread more because of how climate is weakening our environment. And I can attest that the loss to that traumatic, traumatic illness was very hard, just as people who are losing family members right now to COVID. And so I think that the, we do have time to address this and, and take advantage of opportunities in our own life. As a mother of a six-year-old, tonight at dinner, he announced we were not going to use any more plastic bags because he had been inspired by a show he saw on Georgia Public Broadcasting this afternoon. Um, and so that really gives me a lot of hope when I see that this next generation is, is ready to make change. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we want to go ahead and, and jump in uh, to the discussion here tonight and, uh, and, and, and get started with what's on everybody's mind. Again, the fact that you would join in on a conversation uh, about the environment when we're struggling with a pandemic and how our lives have so fundamentally changed is greatly appreciated by all of us. But know that if there's actually a connection um, between uh, this incident, this pandemic, uh, and perhaps others that may, other viruses that may come into our consciousness in the near future. And again, uh, the object of this is not to overwhelm anybody um, or scare anybody. Uh, the object is to take control of the information and knowledge, knowledge available to us uh, so that we can begin uh, to order our own lives or our own government, community, and policy uh, so that we can take control of this and uh, come up with solutions together. So I, I want to kick it to Mandy first, and then we're going to go around uh, and speak with everyone here tonight. But Mandy, if you could just talk a minute about the connection between viruses and, uh, and, and global warming uh, or climate crisis, how, how the way we're living and changing our own environment is, is bringing some of these viruses uh, to our doorstep uh, in, in a way that has never happened before. Thank you for that question. Um, as we have, as we study the effects of a cha the changing temperatures, that is allowing for and driving animals, whether they be mosquitoes or bacteria um, or, you know, actual animals like deer to move, the, the temperature changes are driving them into areas they've not typically lived before, which means that they typically, they don't have the same type of predators uh, when they move into that. And they're able to thrive in essence. And so we will be seeing more infectious disease spread. And as we're a global system now with, with air travel and the way that we like shipping, these vectors are able to travel differently and we are living that right now. Um, and just as mosquito-borne illnesses have become more common in our state, even with Lyme disease showing up on the Georgia coast, um, those are things that our health system we're living right now is not ready for, but it, it impacts 
our lives and we have to change our systems. And that's one reason I'm so drawn to your leadership, Teresa, because we need more effective federal leadership within all of our agencies, health, environment, infrastructure. And uh, we also need to bring back the strength to our environmental laws. We know that this administration um, has defanged the EPA and weaken many of our environmental laws, and that must change. We need strong leadership like you in the Senate to restore these environmental laws. Well, you know, it's interesting with um, this pandemic that we're uh, learning more about every day. Uh, I think we were all shocked and caught unaware. Uh, we know that our, our friends in Asia were dealing with things like SARS and MERS, um, you know, years ago, and, and that really didn't affect us as much here. And so, uh, we had the luxury uh, to, to ignore um, problems in the rest of the world. But what we saw, and, and we are critiquing now, the government's response to a pandemic that was coming our way. Uh, and so what we, what we understand is that you can actually craft policy that um, get, puts all of our 325 million people on the same page in the 50 separate states and moving in a way, whether it's through identifying those cases, identifying people who have, um, who have died because of uh, a suspected COVID-19 infection, um, and, and then do the contact tracing and so forth very early on. And these things can actually mitigate the spread and then therefore mitigate the impact. So we've seen that policy and leadership makes a difference in this instance. It can do the exact same for the environment. And, and that's what we need to understand. The other thing is that it's not just, it doesn't just stop at our borders, right? Uh, so we can't just close the border to climate crisis, uh, just like we couldn't close the border uh, to this pandemic. It, 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 we can actually see the interconnectedness of these nations. And this isn't just something in modern times, don't forget, you know, the Spanish flu of, of, of 1918 um, traveled in, in much the same way, even when we didn't have a lot of the uh, modern conveniences of travel that we have today. So, so we are and have always been connected. And yes, who's leading our government, who's crafting our policy makes a huge difference in the preparedness of, of how we address these, these challenges. So I want to kick it to anybody else on the panel who wants to speak about the intersection of the pandemic uh, and, uh, and the environment. Uh, and so just any random thoughts or comments about that before we um, move on a little bit into the next subject. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna jump in here and hey everybody, it's Briante at GCV. Um, you know, I, I, when the pandemic came down, the first thing I, I thought about were folks uh, that couldn't work. The first thing I thought about were people um, you know, who are going to be impacted um, financially by this crisis, people who don't have the luxury to work from home. So I was sort of already um, in a mental space of, oh my goodness, this is, this is really bad uh, for, for uh, communities of color, lower income communities, people that, um, you know, rely a lot on that in-person activity to, to, to make a livelihood. And then the news came out um, that Harvard had done some research and, uh, you know, early analysis of the data that we were getting back um, from the virus showed that the places that are impacted the worst and the places that have the highest, um, you know, fatality rates from the disease are, are places with high air pollution, which are also places with high concentrations of people of color um, and low income folks. Uh, Metro Atlanta uh, being one of those areas, the South Metro area in particular, uh, tons of counties who are, um, you know, in non-attainment uh, for the clean, the clean ozone standards that they're, they're uh, supposed to be adhering to, um, you know, these are heavily dominated uh, communities, communities full of people of color. So, you know, the connection between uh, fatality rates and air pollution um, in this community it is is it's just so clear and there's um, you know no uh, this is something that environmental community environmental activists have been talking about for quite some time uh, we've said that these are the communities on the front line of existing environmental pollution um, and when climate change impacts start to be felt 
this is the community that's going to feel those impacts. And so as Mandy said, disease is a manifestation of a changing climate. It's one of many things that we can expect is more diseases, um, you know, becoming, you know, bigger deals than they used to be. Um, and just right now, we've got the evidence that backs up that claim that, hey, look, this community is going to be hit, be hit the hardest. We have that data from Harvard <laughs> that's yeah. showing it. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's a little reckless, um, you know, that we've got folks who are being told they can go back to work um, when, when we are still so early on and how this disease is going to play out. And, and again, the, the folks that are eager to get back to work are those people relying on those in-person, you know, sort of foot traffic, you know, ways to generate money and um, it's communities of color, uh, lower income communities that um, are being put at risk. Uh, and so all of this is hopefully coming out clear, but it's just like this, this double layered, just layering of challenges um, for, for, for the communities that I, I work in, so. Sure, and, you know, you're seeing it with a lot of these frontline service workers, uh, whether they're the uh, people leading our transportation systems, uh, working in the grocery stores, uh, even uh, the healthcare workers, uh, the, the folks who are cleaning the hospitals and the healthcare facilities, uh, just night after night, you see them being impacted disproportionately. And you also see uh, in Southwest Georgia, for instance, uh, we have the five highest counties for death per capita um, out of the, the 10 highest counties, where five of them are in Southwest Georgia. And I think along the lines of what you were saying, Briante, is when you have a, a, an infrastructure that is a community infrastructure that is weakened because there haven't been ample resources provided or there's been a disparate impact of, um, of, of pollution in this case uh, or, or, or other ills in the community and the environment, then, then when you have a stressor such as this virus, it goes straight to those weaknesses in the infrastructure. And so you see in Southwest Georgia, what you had was a lack of a, um, a healthcare system. You had people with pre-existing conditions, asthma, um, heart disease, lung disease, uh, diabetes, and so forth. And so they were literally physically sitting ducks for this virus. And then when they were exposed to it, it, it uh, moved so quickly and affected so many people exponentially because they, they were just sitting there ripe for this type of circumstance. And so we see that playing out now in a, in a healthcare system way, in a public health way, but it also manifests itself on a regular basis, as you've pointed out, um, with the disparate impact of uh, pollution um, and, and other environmental justice issues uh, that we too often take for granted those that don't have access to power and access to the resources uh, to fight the injustice being um, uh, pushed upon them. Um, I, Chandra, I don't want to uh, leave you out of the conversation. Did you have any thoughts related to the pandemic and the intersection of the environment and, and the impact related to um, environmental justice and social justice? Definitely, and thank you, um, Teresa, for inviting me to be um, a part of the town hall tonight and, and the team. It's, uh, it's a critical conversation. I have been, quite frankly, overwhelmed by the number of, overwhelmed but not overwhelmed by the number of articles and writings and studies that have come out about uh, not just the link between climate change and coronavirus, but once again about the disproportionate impact on Black people, Indigenous communities, um, com low wealth communities um, around these impacts. You know, to Briante's point, um, we have a large African American population in the South. Uh, we know that the South um, bears a disproportionate burden of billion dollar climate weather disasters uh, in the South. We have 80% um, of counties that experience persistent poverty in the South. Um, three of the largest carbon polluting uh, power plants are, are in the South. You know, the, the list goes, goes on and on. And when we, talk about, uh, when we talk about climate change and we talk about COVID, uh, we have to talk about the amplification of the inequities and how they're being exacerbated. Um, we know that fossil fuel based energy production um, is detrimental um, to all of our health, but disproportionately impacts 
um, African Americans and uh, communities of, of lower wealth. All of the vulnerabilities that are um, that make you more vulnerable to COVID, as as we've learned, are the same ones that um, are present in communities who have um, been intentionally cited. <laughs> Let's not forget that the there's intentionality around the situations that we are in. Um, systemic racism, structural racism is real, and we are still feeling the effects of racist federal policy like redlining um, that has placed um, our, our lower wealth communities, people of color in areas right next to these polluting, many polluting facilities. Um, it's not lost on me that as we talk about Albany and Doherty County, Georgia, um, whose numbers are right up there with, with New York, you know, as far as the, the impacts that they are experiencing right now. And one of our organizers um, in, called me in tears today, literally in tears because Federal Energy Regulatory Commission just approved um, some release from the Sobel gas um, pipeline there. And we know that those air compressor stations um, almost immediately deteriorate the air quality. And we know who is disproportionately impacted by that deteriorating air quality. So here we are on Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, 10 year anniversary of the BP oil spill, um, 25 years since, you know, the, or plus since the National Environmental um, Justice uh, Act, all of these things are, are still happening. And here we are in, in crisis mode, almost caught flat footed when everything that we know we need to be doing is very clear and very laid out. Um, what we are missing is not just the people power to push this forward, but political will and leadership, particularly at the federal level. Um, if there's nothing we've learned over the last three years is how important it is to have leadership at the federal level, not just at the top, um, but in our Congress for people who are willing to stand up and make sure that we're not just offering programs, we're developing policy uh, that can provide systemic change. Yeah, one of the most reprehensible things that's been going on as we're literally dealing with this national crisis um, of, of public health and, and economic um, challenge is the opportunity, the political opportunity uh, to roll back environmental regulations uh, for particular and targeted um, profit for corporations uh, and, and the other misuse of executive power, frankly, um, at this moment for uh, certain constituencies. It's, it's shocking if you think about it. And, and the fact that, that at this moment, when we're dealing with something that's taking all of the capacity of, of this country uh, to deal with, to save our people, to try and steady the civic realm as much as possible and, and, and try to mitigate this tremendous impact long-term to our economy, that we would have people taking advantage um, of, of these public resources um, and, and suspending the, the regulatory framework that, that protects us. It, it's just, it's jaw dropping really. I don't know if you all have any uh, thoughts particularly uh, uh, about that, but we're uh, certainly running in the wrong direction. What we need to do is, is shine a very bright light on those that would abuse power in this particular moment uh, for political or targeted economic benefit at, at, again, a much more profound and broad-based uh, negative impact to the people. Yeah, I feel when all of this was happening, uh, sort of breaking out, uh, there was also this rolling in of news about all of these rules that had been rolled back by the Trump administration, sort of taking advantage of everyone's attention being on coronavirus and doing things like rolling back um, some of the standards that help us, uh, you know, clean up coal ash around plants, uh, rolling back clean car stand uh, standards, which um, for me, I mean, I don't know if you can, there's a MARTA sign behind me, um, you know, transportation, I spent a lot of time trying to move that um, forward. And uh, it's the largest uh, sector for carbon emissions in the United States. So he's 
you know, rolled back these clean car standards, um, you know, at a time where we know higher levels of air pollution equals more fatality from, you know, the, the virus. So, it, you know, I definitely have been watching these different things that the administration has done and, and it's, it's, to, it's in the wrong direction, totally in the wrong direction. I echo Chandra, we need strong leadership um, at the federal level, moving us in the right direction. There are, I think, are things that we need to be doing, like strengthening those standards, um, like ex you know, investing more in um, public transportation, for example. We need to get folks uh, other ways to get from point A to point B, not rolling back standards. Uh, we need to be transitioning to clean energy, not making it easier for um, you know, power utilities to pollute um, and stick with their, their, their current forms of energy. We want to be pushing investments in renewables. Um, that is the kind of leadership that we need the federal government to take a strong stance on policy-wise and then also you know, move the dollars into those programs as well. So you know, more than just stating a commitment or just you know, crafting some policy, but moving the dollars behind it, <laughs> because um, that actually makes me think about uh, when we are rebuilding the economy after this, um, when we have to jump start the re, re jump start the economy post coronavirus. There's going to be dollars moved into communities, and the question is, are we going to spend that money? Uh, wisely, are we going to spend it investing in these infrastructure changes that are needed to get that cleaner air, um, that are needed to lift these communities who are dealing with the impacts of it up? You know, that's the opportunity I see after this, and whoever gets elected um, in November is going to play a big role for advocating for Georgia and the, the investments Georgia needs in, in that area. Well, what, you know, what's amazing at this particular moment is that we could um, be using, we just passed a bill, a $2 trillion bill for emergency liquidity uh, to, to reinforce our, our hospitals and, and get money out into the system to keep the, the economy going. And that's an appropriate first step. But here we have this opportunity to invest in more than just distributing money, but to invest in a new era infrastructure that we know we otherwise desperately need. So a, a smart clean energy grid uh, making tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs um, immediately uh, when we have people, these, these outrageous unemployment rates we're seeing um, every week with pe millions of people filing unemployment claims. Uh, and, and we can start to create a whole new industry that's going towards building something we desperately need and investing in our future. You talk about wanting the markets to react positively. You start investing in a new industry. You start creating infrastructure that will return public wealth and public value. Then, then that's when uh, you start to climb out of this. And, and so I hope that in these next bills, uh, we'll be seeing, we, we know what we need. We've been talking about this for decades um, and it just simply starts with um, a smart clean energy grid. Um, there are many other opportunities for uh, technological advancements and carbon capture and so, so many other things. And so what are we waiting on? I, I, you know, now's a, a wonderful time where we could be investing in something this country's hungry for and, and creating, you know, potentially millions of jobs over, uh, over years. And so, um, you know, I, I, I know obviously these challenges we have before us, but we should be facing our future and, and not running backward on these environmental regulations for short-term political favor. And it's, it's purely reprehensible, particularly at a time when the country is looking the other way because they're worried about an imminent health threat to them and their families. Um, uh, Mandy, did you have anything to, to add to the conversation? On the same, the same vein, I know Chandra and Briante are staunch advocates for federal policy and would love to hear their top three wishes they would have for you to work on when you're in the Senate. All right. So what, you, you got the ear of your future United States Senator, ladies. What would you, what would you tell her? Um, Go ahead. You go ahead, Chandra. I've been trying a lot. 
I'll, I think first and foremost, it's um, real investment in establishing and expanding our clean energy infrastructure. I mean, we have, we have a roadmap for this. Um, there are very uh, clear, direct ways we can um, fund investment, create financing mechanisms to reach. We know that funding and financing are key barriers from making sure that clean energy, um, energy efficiency programs, especially distributed clean energy like rooftop solar, uh, the barriers they face are around funding and financing. So there can be immediate direct investment to build up those programs, um, specifically to work with I think cities um, and larger municipalities to make sure that they have the funding and financing support that they need to, to take some risk and make strong investments in that. I think that um, some strong, stronger um, worker protections, particularly in the clean energy and energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency space to build, um, you know, to build that workforce. Um, but not just the workforce. There's got to be funding um, for, I'm not going to say small business, but I'm going to say entrepreneurship um, and uh, smaller mom and pop business ownership um, and technology innovation. Um, we know that those are immediate paths to community wealth building um, for communities who are first and most impacted um, by our changing climate, by systemic disinvestment, um, so the funding and backing to jumpstart those businesses um, and ultimately jumpstart those um, clean energy economies and wealth building opportunities. Um, that's really only two um, with a whole lot um, built on there, but the things that flow from those two major things, uh, two major things are key. Excellent, and Briante. Yeah, so I, I think mine are two big, Two buckets, okay, <laughs> it's the simplest way I could put it. But they're consistent with Chandra, you know, in talking about investing in um, a clean energy economy. So I think that's that's the the one of the main asks I have is let's let's make those investments in a clean energy economy. And what that looks like is having a really strong commitment to 100% clean energy at the federal level for the country. Um, we want a renewable portfolio standards. I think it's it's important that utilities are putting dollars into these. Uh, renewable energy um, technologies. And that also means that we're not investing in dirty energy or adding more funding into uh, the fossil fuel industry. Um, so we know that we've got lots of subsidies uh, for the fossil fuel industry. We should definitely end those and transition that money into the clean energy economy. Um, a good example of that is, you know, this call to drill off of Georgia's coast, um, offshore drilling on the coast. Uh, that's just, just an investment, a, a, an investment in dirty energy when we could be making an investment um, in solar and wind. So uh, that one first big bucket is that transition to 100% clean energy economy. And then the second bucket is uh, transportation is, again, a big issue. It, we, we have to increase investment and um, uh, public transportation infrastructure. So not just like within a city you know like marta but also across the state connecting georgia's cities to each other giving people mobility both figuratively and literally um the economic mobility is tied to transportation mobility so we could be investing in that and taking cars off the road and cleaning air all at the same time and uh you know i talked about clean car standards so i'd like to see us continue those clean car standards continue supporting um the growth of the ev market but those are the two buckets is energy and transportation and uh, there's a number of other things that we could be doing environmentally um yeah. those two are the are, i think the major levers for climate for mitigating climate well we want to get to caroline in a minute so i'm going to kick it back to to bambi but i will say thank you um so very much for that and of course i have a policy paper on climate crisis where we talk um about a lot of these things removing uh, the burdensome regulation on alternative energy sources, uh, beginning to in invest in these alternative energies. And, and, and we need to start pricing the true cost of carbon. I mean, this is no free market. There, you know, we've got the fossil fuel industry is being subsidized heavily. 
uh, in many, many ways, but also in the use and, 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 um, and, and the negative impact on our public resources that we're paying the cost for. Uh, that we're picking up the tab on. And so, and so we're going to have to uh, have, you know, we don't have the luxury of a lot of time to sit around and debate it. We'll be thoughtful, we'll be prudent, um, but it's time for bold ideas. Um, we need bold ideas, we need them now. And we've been talking about this for many, many decades. We know what needs to be done. And, and the two most impactful things that we can do is increasing um, the price of carbon, uh, and and to, to match its true impact and make those who are uh, who are dealing in that particular industry and in the production of, of, of that particular substance to um, absorb the true cost of doing business and, and the impact on the people that it's it's affecting and and then secondly you know one of the most impactful things we can do is is reduce emissions uh, methane and other emissions and, and we do that in a significant way. Um, then, then we've got a real opportunity. We know the other things to, to address deforestation and, 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 as I mentioned, carbon capture. And there's all sorts of really innovative things people are talking about using our timber industry and using our farmers in a new way for carbon capture. We can do all those things, but we know the things that will move the needle the quickest and, and, and the most. And, and we need to make those tough decisions because it's impacting people's lives right now and today. So. Um, Caroline, we want to hear from you. Uh, Mandy, do you want to um, go ahead and get Caroline started? Yes, thank you. So the your last point that this is real to all of us, I think about Chandra's story from earlier in this hour about her colleague who felt the real pain today, um, and many of us are. We are the this is a traumatic situation that we're dealing with, and we invited Caroline on today to help all of us as we are trying to face this. So, Carolyn, please um, share some hope and guidance with us today. Uh, well, first of all, I'm very grateful to Teresa for um, hosting this important conversation. It's uh, always timely and particularly urgent uh, in this moment. So I'm really grateful for the space and for the opportunity to be with all of these amazing people. It is, uh, it's really inspiring to me. I know these are, um, difficult times, but I see so much hope um, and so many leaders, and I'm looking forward to more and more opportunities um, to be involved. Uh, in reflecting on what's going on in these big conversations, sometimes it can feel overwhelming with, you know, there's, there is a lot of work to be done, and it's scattered all across the board. The positive part is there is work that can be done in every corner. So whatever you, whatever your field is, you can bring those skills and that energy, um, that creativity to bear on addressing climate change. It's needed, you're needed in, uh, in changing our behaviors and policies and laws in the upcoming years. But I always invite people when we're dealing with these major issues um, to allow space for healing and for rest. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. That won't be a permanent condition if you allow yourself uh, some space to take a break. And thinking about this today on Earth Day, um, trauma is experienced, it can be abrupt, it can be something that happens in a moment, or it can be something ongoing. And I think many of us um, are particularly around the changing climate, we're aware of the changes, we're feeling the impacts in different ways, or we're connected to communities that are feeling the impacts in different ways. Uh, my church community, St. Bede's, in the morning we worship in English, in the evening we worship in Spanish, and this particular moment of pandemic, we're feeling in our body just acutely how this is being experienced across a range of communities. And we have people experiencing um, job loss all across the board. We have people who are essential workers that are having to go out to work in challenging conditions. We're having people unable to go to work, um, people who are fearful of going out to get assistance when they are needing it. And so we're, we're holding all of this in our community body. And, and our church is just a subset of what everyone is experiencing in everybody's communities. So it's, it's a lot to take on. And we carry trauma in our bodies often, which I'm sure people are aware of. You, you feel tension in your body or you have difficulty sleeping or you're constantly carrying around anxiety. And today on Earth Day, I was thinking a way to, um, to ease and heal that tension in the body is just to be outside. And outside reminds us this is a really lovely planet that we're on and a planet that's 
sustains us. And uh, just spending some time with that, you have permission to do that. There is infinite work to be done, but you don't have to do it all yourself and you don't have to do it all today. It will be there for you. And when we give ourselves a break, we're able to get back into it with more energy and, and uh, more power and more hope. So I, I offer that because when we're facing big things, we've got to develop the skills to be able to stay in it and um, finding ways to take rest and to remember the environment that we care so much about is a beautiful place. It's something for us to delight in and everyone should be able to have the ease to delight in it regardless of economic status. Um, and that's something that we're fighting for. That's a beautiful thing. That's a fun and delightful thing. And that can remain part of the conversation. It can be energizing when we get tired, which we will. So I'll offer that. Um, the other piece that feels so exciting to me about this moment, so my, my work at King & Spalding is in commercial finance. I work in a range of financing transactions, um, investments, and some of it in the real estate area, but really across the board. And so I attend various conferences and go to you know webinars and that sort of thing in my trade. Over the last two years, the frequency at which this conversation about the changing climate and how it's going to be addressed comes up all the time. I went to a commercial real estate conference in January. It was the topic, the environment was a topic of the maybe one of the panels. It was a focused part of the conversation on every single panel. All of the people who are focused on investing, in that case it was in real estate, but it's coming up everywhere. Everybody is talking about this, this issue and thinking thinking about how we are going to address it. People are in a moment, I believe, of looking for guidance and leadership. Um, they are eager to act. They're trying to figure out what the smart action is. And 10 years ago, I was not seeing these sorts of conversations and certainly not at this rate and frequency. This is a really exciting moment. There are people ready to get involved and to change, to change habits. They're just looking for some leadership. Um, so, I'm excited for that. Well, you know, Caroline, it, you're so right, now, and we appreciate you coming on to to give us some hope and some uh, sort of spiritual guidance and in, uh, in this time. But you know, people need to remember we've done remarkable things before. As a little girl, I remember uh, watching on TV the pictures in LA and and even in Atlanta where you couldn't see the buildings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it looked like China looks now. And because of the Clean Air, Clean Water Act, because of the steps we took, because of the celebrations like Earth Day and the mobilization of activists that said, absolutely not, we will not tolerate this uh, expenditure of our environment. Uh, we're going to be better and we're going to be smarter. Um, we changed those things. I remember hearing about the Cuyahoga River burning. A river was burning. Uh, and, and we changed those things. And, and we also had the fluorocarbons that were, uh, you know, eating away at the ozone. And, and I remember, you know, learning about it in elementary school and being told how to do better. Um, you know, being um, it, it, it so dependent on oil that it was a national security risk to the country. And we had leaders who said, well, we're going to find a way to do better. We're going to ask you to set your thermostats and, 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 and very, very simple things. But you can call this country to action with leadership. You can break this down. You know, people do not feel hopeless, even in the face of insurmountable odds, seemingly insurmountable odds, when you give them a plan. When you say, here's the plan. Here, here's the way we can reduce the, the increasing temperatures of this earth and, and and we can do these things by 2050 and we can save these uh, calamitous impacts that we're hearing about but you have to embrace science you have to have these moments where you talk about what reality is and, and what the consequences may be and that's not to instill hopelessness or fear it, it what it is, is is to inform you so you can join a plan and that's the hopeful part of this so that's why policy is so important. That's why leadership is so important. And I know, um, Mandy, we want to get to questions because we wanted to set the stage in a, a sort of a little bit of an unusual way, not high tech, but more conversational, um, have people sharing their experiences and observations. 
but we want to get to your questions too. And so, so Mandy, we'll kick it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for all that you have shared today. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to the environmental filmmaker from Augusta, Mark Alberton. Thank you, Mark, for watching us today. He has an upcoming film, The River of the Water of Life, which explores the topic Caroline was just talking about, the spiritual rationale converging with scientific mandates for environmental protection. So I look forward to watching that, Mark. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank that. you. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we have a question for you from Cindy from Athens. She would like to know what your first environmental related action would be if, when you're elected. Well, the first thing we're going to do is, uh, is stop the Trump uh, executive orders and it, administrative rollbacks of, um, of these regulations. Uh, that, that's the first order. And of course, the, the de facto Democratic nominee uh, Joe Biden has already stated very clearly he intends to do that and go even further. But I, I will tell you what we need one step further is we have to have courage in our legislature because um, because of an atrophied uh, muscle in the legislature, because of uh, political cowardice too often, uh, we have lacked uh, legislating the things we know can make a difference and we've left too much up to the executive branch and to the administrative agencies. And so then what happens is when you have a radically different administrative um, vision as we have right now, it's all undoable. Uh, and, and so we, need, we know what these best standards are. We know what the Obama administration had uh, put into place um, and was working uh, to make us uh, better global participants and, and to um, assure our future um, climate health as well as um, our national security and economic security through better environmental policies. And, and we need to enact those through legislation. And, and again, we, we know the economic impacts of assessing um, the true price of carbon uh, and, and uh, dealing with emissions and incentivizing those things that need to be incentivized. Um, and, and you know, um, using a little bit of carrot and stick um, providing the true cost of those things that, that have cost to us publicly. Um, those are tough decisions, but they've got, they've got to be made because um, the public health, our national security is much more, and our environmental sanctity is much more important um, than political uh, short-term uh, discomfort. Thank you. Um, Julian from Atlanta uh, says, the climate catastrophe is so dire that it requires drastic action but the U.S. is run on a bipartisan basis for the benefit of big business. How will you change this? You know, um, first of all, there are some businesses that try to be good corporate citizens. So, you know, you can have public-private partnerships, and, and I'll be specific. Um, you can have a large entity, a large corporation, that has the technological capacity to partner with us in the type of advancements we need for carbon capture, for instance, which could be uh, phenomenally um, beneficial to this effort that we're talking about. Uh, so you incentivize those who want to be active participants rowing in the direction that we as a national community and a global community need to row. And then those who would loot the public resource, um, environmental resource of this country, uh, of course, are going to have to pay a price for it. And, and that can come through any number of uh, regulations. Uh, first, you stop subsidizing it. Uh, for goodness sake, you don't subsidize and reinforce people's negative um, and harmful behavior. And, and then uh, if they're profiting off of it, you must reassess the cost of their doing business. Um, and that will affect uh, their business decisions. And so I, I think it's about finding new coalitions of, of reasonableness and rationality um, by pursuing people's own best interests. You know, too often uh, people say, well, you know, I, I, I'm not my brother's keeper. And, and I don't care what happens in China, and, and I don't care what happens in the Paris Climate Accord. Who cares what happens in Paris? Um, well, okay, uh, care about yourself then, um, because we have seen that what happens in China, what happens in Paris, what happens um, in, in any part of this country uh, will impact you either through um, the economy, uh, either through um, civic stability, as people are dealing with this kind of severe disruption, um, this type of pandemic and public health. Um, if, if you don't have the courage 
uh, to, to deal with these issues, then you don't deserve to serve. And so what we need now is a call to action to put the right people in office who can make these difficult decisions. We don't need to demonize anybody. We need to give them an opportunity to get it right or we will handle it. And, and you know, we've been through these challenges before uh, in, in different circumstances, but with the auto industry. I mean, you know, the auto industry fought for years putting in three-point seat belts and putting in airbags that now we completely take for granted. And, and until texting and driving came about, uh, we had dramatically reduced the number of traffic fatalities because of those airbags. But I am telling you that the, the, the auto industry wanted nothing to do with it until the court system um, placed on them through civil litigation, some of which that I was involved with through the firm I was in, um, the, ac the, the actual cost of, of killing their customers. And, and once they started doing that, you saw a radically different perspective by those corporations pursuing their financial best interest by providing safety. Um, so we can do that. Uh, we did it um, in a lesser, to a lesser effect, but with the tobacco industry. Um, so, so there are folks out there who are having public cost on us, uh, and, and we need to make the tough decisions that if they can't get it right, then, then we will help them adjust what's in their financial best interest by assessing the accurate cost of their doing business. Thank you. Agriculture is a big business in this state. We also have a thriving uh, organic and small farm community here. And Dante from Atlanta asked, says farmers have been hit hard by the climate change. How can we help them navigate this new era? You know, Dante, it's so amazing that you say that because I think to speak in generalities, people have always assumed that farmers, uh, fishermen, shrimpers, and so forth were Republicans to assign a party to them because they're outside of metropolitan areas. They're in so-called rural Georgia. And so there's people that just assume that that party, I think largely that would be correct, that a lot of people in those industries uh, probably would ascribe to being Republicans. Um, but what's interesting is that you talk to a farmer, you talk to a fisherman and shrimper right now, and they're gonna tell you all about climate change. Um, they're going to tell you about how this isn't right, um, that the shrimp are migrating north, um, that the fish are dying, that they have uh, this bacteria they've never seen on it before after 30 years of, of fishing, that, that they're just seeing things that, that don't make sense. They live with the land. And so if their interests, um, their desperation at this point to find solutions to carry on um, the profession that they love uh, depends on being associated with leaders and policies that are, are correcting this, this climate impact to, to their industry. And so there's a real opportunity to bring new people in, into the fold here because they're not following lockstep with climate deniers, with science deniers. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we can reach out to them. So my, my message uh, to the farmers and to the others that work and live off the land is, is join those people who are, are ready to make bold change and bold proposals for change um, and shake up the political status quo that has delivered to you um, this climate circumstance, uh, delivered to you the failed Hurricane Michael relief after that Category 5 hurricane, which we know was a result of, of global warming because the increased temperatures increased the severity um, of those hurricanes, and then the failure to get you emergency relief, and, 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 and refuse to join those that have delivered to you um, the terrafors on our own farmers. Um, let's, let's remove ourselves from the despair uh, that these policies, these reckless policies, have inflicted upon Georgia's number one industry, farmers. Um, so begin to align yourself to the people who are proposing those things that will positively affect your community um, and, and your business and your family's quality of life. Teresa, your passion and just mastery of the facts is so inspiring. Just reaffirms why I'm excited about you to be our next senator. We have a tremendous number of Facebook questions that are just outstanding. And thank you all for your attendance and your engagement. 
Um, but unfortunately, we are at the hour. So if I could turn it over to you, Teresa, to, um, to just take us home. Yeah, I, I would just say this, you know, when I became mayor of Columbus, Georgia, um, I, I have to say, I don't know that I thought that there was any environmental policy uh, necessary. Of course, I have always, my husband and I love the outdoors. We go to the national parks and what, what this administration has done to public lands, national parks, Antiquities Act, and, and, and so many others is just, is, is horrendous. Um, but but I, I always had a love for the outdoors, a, a reverence uh, for our natural environment. But when I became mayor of Columbus, Georgia, there were all of these things that were brought to my doorstep. Uh, one, we had an underground tank farm, uh, fuel tank farm that was literally on the, the banks of the Chattahoochee River. Um, I was told that that was impossible to remove. It was owned by the Port Authority and they had a very lucrative lease uh, with a private corporation. Uh, to pump those fuels and that turbine sulfate uh, in, into those underground tanks. But let me tell you what, with the conviction of, of knowing that some sort of cataclysmic disaster of that leaking into the Chattahoochee River would have been on my conscience, on all of our consciences, we were able to remove that tank farm through negotiations. We were able to put 66 miles of interconnected alternative transportation grid in in Columbus. So today and someday soon, no matter where you live in Columbus, you'll be able to live here and move around without owning a car. We, we did um, a, a feasibility study for high-speed passenger rail um, from Columbus to the Atlanta airport, uh, which made the short list of high-speed passenger rail in this country for the most feasible, uh, cost-efficient um, high-speed passenger rail line. You know, we can do these remarkable things if a city of 200,000 people can do those unthinkable and seemingly unsolvable things. Think of what we can do as a country. Think of what we can resolve and solve together. So I hope that on this Earth Day, um, you've heard a slightly different approach, um, a, a more heartfelt and thoughtful uh, approach and, and perhaps less scientific, but we wanted to include more people in the conversation. I hope it gets you thinking um, about where you want to put uh, your emphasis and your support for the leadership you want for your family, for our public safety, for our public health, um, for our communities, all of our communities, um, for, for a just future. And, uh, and, and I hope you'll consider that. I hope you'll follow us at TeresaTomlinson.com. Get engaged in this Senate race, because I am telling you, the control of the Senate is vitally important to the future of this country and most certainly uh, is important uh, to our environment. Um, so thank you all for being with us. Again, happy 50th uh, Earth Day, and thank you all for what you do, and thank you to these amazing panelists, um, and, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.